This episode mentions comfort women and may not be suitable for all listeners. For the first time ever, this is before after OM. My name is Atsushi Sakahara. I'm a filmmaker based in Kyoto, Japan, and a survivor of the Sharinga attack in Tokyo, 1995. I'm Pearl Chan, a film and birth worker based in Hong Kong. I've been working with Atsushi since 2018 on his documentary, The Cult Leader and Me, which now has a final cut and is looking for distribution. Saringa's attack took place uh, in 1995 and uh, attacked by the uh, doomsday cult Om Shinrikyo. I am a victim of the attack and uh, I didn't know much about the details until I started uh, shooting about this documentary because I always try to avoid, you know, and uh, in a way I have lost 25 years, you know. I left a good job and uh, also left Japan after the attack. I had to get away. I earned an MBA at uh, UC Berkeley, but I suffered so much because I couldn't work for a big company with good salary for post effects such as fatigue, tired eyes, and PTSD. Meaning, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you lose air, you know, you lose energy. Mm-hmm. You cannot, you cannot resist. You fall into a sleep. That started and I realized when I was at MBA too, because of course I wanted to learn, right? That's why I went to MBA, right? Mm-hmm. I was sitting in the front seat of the over room, right? Mm-hmm. Then uh, the professor told me at the end of the class, you know, Atsushi, you should have a coffee. And my answer, my honest answer was, I had a two. Esp- Dubio espresso on my way. No, that, he thought he, you know, I, I was making a bad joke. He was not happy, but that was truth. I wanted to listen to, I wanted to learn, but I fallen into sleep because I was so tired. I, I was so exhausted. All of a sudden, I lose my uh, energy. Does that happen a lot now? Yeah. Yes. Still, yes. Hmm. So it's hard, you know, to work. You know, I had the chance to meet some other victims. We share the same feeling. That is, we want to make the best of our suffering, you know, for society or the rest of the people, or the rest of the, you know, the people in the society. Then that helps us feel better. I think if I can make film, and the people learn something and and then uh not to be uh trapped by any cult i feel also my suffering has some meaning you know mm-hmm. that helps me feel better mm-hmm. The coronavirus means that the film industry is currently very much at a standstill, and with so many festivals being postponed, it's really hard for us to know what is the next step for the documentary. So, we're making this podcast to provide more context, if you will, for the film itself. And as we were doing research for the film and for this podcast, it became increasingly hard to see OM as an outlier. OM is a product of its context and organizations like it emerged from a history of religious oppression, followed by the Japanese rebuilding of national identity in the post-war period, during which freedom of religion was established. So while we were researching this episode, it was really hard not to fall down a rabbit hole because there's so many new religions in Japan and they each have really fantastic stories. Um, And so we might go back to these stories down the road, but for now, we're really going to be focused on Om Shinrikyo. Today, we'll start with the state religion in Meiji period Japan and move through to the post-war era, finishing with two new religions, Soka Gakkai and Agon Shu, and their influences on Om Shinrikyo, the cult behind the Tokyo sarin gas attack of 1995. If you are a, a, a victim, you are a victim. You're not a journalist. So this is no Kurubeki no Kiteru in the night of Soka. So 
Hiromi to the first prime minister in Japan, right, had been to the UK just before the Meiji era and, and thought that we needed something like Christianity in the UK for Japan. Something to unite the faith and become a modern country to catch up with the Western countries, you know. Then, uh, you know, when the, uh, you know, as a part of the government, of course, the Prime Minister Hirobu Mito was involved in establishing the Japanese Imperial Constitution. In the Imperial Constitution, uh, they created the Kokutai concept, that is, a, uh, Emperor is supreme above the country and everything, unified in everything. And it's, it's sort of a spiritual, a divine, supreme existence. So that's how Japan came up with the concept of, of Koktai and what the Koktai is, I think. Mm -hmm. um... So yeah, in the Meiji period, they further developed this idea of Kokutai, which actually existed from the Edo period, but it was That's used, correct. and it was the That's first correct. time it was put in the law, yes, in well, the constitution well, it, itself. That's right. Uh, and so in order to protect Kokutai, they also enacted a number of laws called the Peace Preservation Laws. Uh, and so the one we want to look at specifically is from 1925, and it is the mm. Public Security Preservation Law. Mm. So this was put in place specifically against left radicals and dissidents, and mm. it made organizing labor and strikes illegal. Mm. This is also around the time of men in Japan being granted the right to vote. So men were granted the right to vote on the 5th of May in 1925, mm. and on the 12th of May of the same year is when they put this public security preservation law in place. Uh, and another thing they did during the war itself, based on this law, is to uh, declare that every Shinto Buddhist, Shinto and Buddhist temple and also any altar at home had to hang a talisman they gave out, which uh, essentially said that, you know, you belong to us, you belong to the Shinto state, the state Shinto faith you believe the emperor is god and so one group that spoke out and we're going to get back to them in an, in um in a few minutes is soka gakai um just to put that down for a moment um i want you to imagine that you're a japanese person living during the second world war and that your entire life the government has been in control of religion and you believe that your emperor is a god and there's you know there're not a lot of pictures of him around you don't really know what he's like but the few that he that the few that are circulating he's very serious and he's always riding a white horse um you know the white horses are named like first frost and white snow uh, and so this is this is the world you're living in a world where your emperor is god and his being god is very much your understanding of your country and subsequently who you are as a person and then August 1945, of course, everything changes. Japan is hit by two atomic bombs and tens of right. thousands of people die immediately. And then for every day after that, tens of thousands more die from radiation and burns. Um, and so the United States of America immediately comes in uh, to sort of take over the country. Um, and the person leading this is General MacArthur. Um, he and he's decided actually that the best way for him to have power in Japan is through the emperor and the really and the elite ruling class. So those people remain in power because he is also in charge of trying war crimes. And so he coordinates witnesses and suspects. Um, and so all the stories they tell never implicate the emperor or his family. Uh, instead, he starts to paint the emperor as a sort of saintly figure who holds no responsibility in the war. Um, and then he releases a photo of his first meeting with the emperor Hirohito. So I just want you to look this photo up. You can just type in General MacArthur and Emperor Hirohito first meeting September 1945. Um, and so what do you see? You know, uh, when we take a look at this picture, I think most of the Japanese think about the uh, dual voice uh, broadcast when uh, there is this sort of uh, emperor's announcement that we lost the war. And especially 
particularly one phrase is to pave the way for grand peace for all the generation to come by enduring the endurables, unendurables, and suffering what is insufferable. You know, this in Japanese, you know, we, <clears throat> we hear so many times every media on August 15th, and in my generation, you know, we were thought so much about the importance of peace, and uh, we are not uh, like uh, the older generation, but I feel it is very, very some sort of strange sentiment. You know, his voice and way of uh, speaking, the, you know, uh, is very distinctive, you know. He was, I learned, you know, from someone, you know, when I was small, you know, he was taught how to speak as an emperor. So if you look up uh, on YouTube, you can find his, you know, speeches, you know, and then the way he speaks is quite different from the way we speak Japanese. For example, in Japanese, I, in English, is watashi, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he says chin. Chin is, can be used as a... Uh, you know, I for I only by emperor. Yeah, we have the same in Chinese. It's some. Ah, okay, same. Okay. <laughs> no, is that that's only by the emperor? Yeah, only by the emperor. Okay, it's so the same, same. You know, Asia is same. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. <laughs> that that word. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to read this passage about uh, MacArthur's exoneration of the emperor and his family. Uh, in the um, Tokyo trials, which were the trials of basically war crimes. Um, sure. So this is, this is how it goes. Um, there has been much criticism for the blanket exoneration of Emperor Hirohito and all members of the imperial family, including Prince Asaka, Prince Fushimi Hiroyasu, Prince Naruhiko Higashikuni and Prince Tsuneyoshi Takeda. The French judge, Henri Bernard, strongly stated in his dissenting opinion that the failure to try Hirohito nullified the trial and made the accused merely accomplices. The U.S. went through great lengths to recast the emperor's image throughout the trial, a move that was sharply contrasted with that of Hitler during the Nuremberg trial. The historian Herbert Bix argues that MacArthur's truly extraordinary measures to save Hirohito from trial as a war criminal had a lasting and profoundly distorting effect, uh, distorting impact on Japanese understanding of the lost war. It is this denial of responsibility or claim of self-defense which, dist which distorts history that is truly the most dangerous. It is also the reason why the Chinese and other victims in Asia have reason to still be angry after so many years. Since the Jewish Holocaust, the West and, the, and Europe have moved on, but they have never forgotten. The same cannot be said of the events that occurred in the East. Mm it's really hard to play what ifs in history you know it's really hard to be like okay well if Hirohito was removed what would have happened um and from my side I'm I'm ethnically Chinese and like we didn't really study a lot of the history in school because I had a very um British schooling where we mostly talked about the west when we talked about World War II and so I actually learned a lot about World War II in Japan through um the rape of Nanking and and also you know my my grandmother lived through the three year and eight months of occupation in Hong Kong and um it was very hard here as well and so it's been really hard researching this because um because it really feels like a justice that was never served because there was no trial that was fair um and also, you know, what what I found out is that there was another Class A war criminal who was not persecuted under uh, MacArthur named Nobusuke Kishi. 
who was known for his brutal rule of Manchukuo, the puppet state in northeast China, and played a significant role in the kidnap and rape of women across Asia. He is named the Devil of Showa and is famous for his racist views. Kishi is easily the war criminal, the Himmler of Japan, and he served three years in prison before the Jap before the Americans decided he was the best person to lead Japan in a pro-American direction. He was Prime Minister of Japan from 1955 to 1960, and his grandson is Shinzo Abe, the current Prime Minister of Japan who is known for denying the Japanese government's involvement in the kidnapping and rape of comfort women, increasing Japan's military, and being a right-wing nationalist. Actually, what do you know about him? As you know, I'm not a, 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 you know, how can I say, historian. And then I, because, you know, we, we mm -hmm. <laughs> to be honest, Japanese history don't, never teaches those things, right? The way they teach Japanese history is very slow and uh, very well maybe calculated, you know? We don't cover the, after the, uh, maybe Taisho or Showa. So we, we, we are not really taught about the World War II. We're not so familiar. And then... Which is crazy because everywhere yeah. in the world, all they talk about is World War II. Yeah. Like every school, year right? in school yeah. was World War II. Yeah, that's World why. That's why. II, and then, you know, II. they somehow, they have a very good coordination with the, uh, with the university. Many, many universities don't ask those things. I think they have an idea that we still need time to have a historical perspective. You know, that's our excuse. And then that's why we are not very familiar with the, those things, you know. But World War II is always discussed in the newspaper, right? You know, like uh, Japanese North Islands, you know, now uh, under... Uh, Russia, right? Shinzo Abe want to get them back. But we do not have a very clear idea. Maybe too dangerous to have a clear idea, you know what I'm saying? Otherwise, we, we have to... If what maybe uh, the government truly believes, you know, if we believe them, maybe we, we you know, we, 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 we have to go into war, right? Who is right, right? If we, we think we are right, you know, maybe... You know, we might have to go into the wall, and we we don't want to. You know, some way, you know, another make make it big. You know, that the what the Japanese government does. It actually reminds me of some conversations I've had with people my age in China who don't learn about the who don't learn about the Tiananmen Square massacre of 1989 until they get to university and they, they talk about it, right? It's not something to be taught. It's something that you talk about. Uh, and it's actually part of why the 2014 Umbrella Revolution happened in Hong Kong was because the government wanted to install something called the National Education and people were very concerned about what that means and what part of history that controls or revises. And so it's so I think it's really important to be very aware of what history is teaching and what history is omitting and revising in schools, because ultimately, um, ultimately, if schools are not teaching it, it's not part of the collective basic understanding of ourselves. And it makes it really easy to manipulate a population if people forget. So it's, it's really important not to forget. <laughs> you can read the books, but you don't know if the book is true, right? It's hard, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's really yeah. hard to tell. I mean, in, in Hong Kong, sometimes on the news, they'll talk about how the language is changing in Japanese school textbooks. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, it's really hard to know what is yeah. true. And it's really hard to sort through bias when there has been such a strong effort to rewrite to rewrite the right. history also also you know i am a survivor right i mm -hmm. experienced how the media treat uh, people right i don't believe mm -hmm. those those people so meaning i don't really believe in I, I, it's very funny you know like in the end i have to make a documentary right but yes. as a victim, I saw many, 
media people or journalists. I don't believe in them at all. You know, so so you know, I don't I don't really. That's why I really wanted them. You don't yes. trust the system. I don't know. You know, I cannot I cannot say anything for sure. Yeah, that's what they say. You know, right? That's the best I, I can say. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is that so the Americans have come in to Japan and and they're rewriting its constitution and they remove, of course, the peace preservation law. So they put in Article 19 and 20, which, you know, generally is called the freedom of religion. So Atsushi, can you read us the freedom of religion? Sure. Articles. OK. Article 19. Freedom of thought and conscience shall not be violated. Article 20, freedom of religion is guaranteed to all. But Article 20 keeps going, going on. But because this is uh, like uh, not to try not to people in Japan to force them to believe in the uh, state Shinto. So through freedom of religion, freedom of thought and the conscience shall not be violated. Right, and so... So these are these are sort of pushbacks against the legacy of state Shinto. And so if you think about everything we've said so far in terms of oppression and police oppression of Japan, uh, of religion in Japan before the end of the war, you can see why people are really serious about maintaining a freedom of religion. Um, and this actually extends to criticism of religion, including newer religions, uh, making them kind of taboo subjects. So Shoka Egawa, who's the preeminent journalist who covers Om Shinrikyo, says, quote, religious freedom is kind of mm. taboo. It cannot mm. be touched. For example, if the government or the police got involved, it would be regarded as a return to the pre-war sure, period. Sure, yes. It's really easy to see how people would embrace this freedom. Suddenly, from being told what to believe specifically that the emperor was God and you had to do what the government said, to having no idea how to make sense of post-war Japan. Many people turn to spirituality of another kind, Shinsukyo, new religions. Right. So after the war, a lot of these new religions popped up, some of them existing before, like Soka Gakkai, and some of them are brand new. And they're usually a mixture of older religions, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, Shinto, as well as ideas of Abrahamic traditions. Um, and actually, a number of them take on Nostradamus, the French astrologer and legion seer and doomsday predictor. And also a lot of the elements in the new religions of Japan are also similar to the new religions of America, which we can go into a bit later. Um, but mostly it's a term applying to religions that were founded in the early to mid 20th century uh, and were able to recruit widely. Uh, and one of the reasons why I think so many of these religions popped up is that in Japan, similar actually to the States, which is an issue covered in the documentary Going Clear about Scientologists, was that there, and still are, tax benefits or tax exemptions for religious organizations. So just off the top of your head, do you know how many religious organizations there are in Japan? 500. 500? Your guess is 500? Yeah. It's 200,000. What can I say? <laughs> but they are not religious. Shinto is one million. Yeah, I can. I'll send you. I'll send you the report later. But there are around two hundred thousand uh, religious organizations who are tax exempt in Japan. But I, a film I really love about this topic is Taxing Woman Two, which is a Juzo Itami film. So everyone knows Tam Popo, but he made so many wonderful films. Um, actually, today I watched uh, The Gentle Art of Japanese Extortion. Um, but anyways, so Taxing Woman Two is about a tax agent who goes after a religious organization because she thinks that they're doing funny something funny with their taxes or that the organization is set up as a farce essentially and it's, it's really fascinating and and just a great fun if you want to have a very um, easy introduction into uh, sketchy religious situations anyways so we're gonna be using the words uh, new religion and cult interchangeably because essentially they're 
they're talking about the same thing, except that new religion is kind of the more politically correct term. But because Om Shinrikyo uh, tried to kill Atsushi, so we're going to go with the less lovely term. <laughs> The three primary characteristics of a cult are a charismatic leader um, who becomes, you know, the object of worship and and generally um, is not accountable to anything uh, or anyone. So actually, it's really interesting because state Shinto is kind of that, right? Because whether or not Hirohito or the emperor, whichever emperor is charismatic or not, they become an object of worship. Um, and they hold no accountability as we see through the war crimes. There's a process of indoctrination. Uh, and so if, if I can even say this, but it's almost like the Japanese education system is that process. Um, and then there's economic, sexual, and other exploitation of the group members by a leader or the ruling class, which is very much the basis of capitalism. Uh, but anyways, those are the three characteristics of a cult, and as you can see, Om actually fits all of those. Um, That's correct. But today we're going to be talking about two new religions of Japan, specifically right. Soka Gakkai and Agon Shu, because they are directly related to Om, and are both really good examples of the movement of new religion and sort of the outline of a cult of that era. Mm. So the first thing we're going to talk about is Soka Kakai, which Atsushi warned me about doing. He says it's very dangerous to talk about Soka Kakai. Yes, it's a taboo. That's the most biggest taboo among taboos in Japan. Really? Soka Kakai? <laughs> you cannot talk about, you're not allowed to talk about in the media. You're gone. You're gone. You never get the job at the TV. <laughs> I'll rule out Japanese television stations from my list of potential employers. Mm. Okay, so... That's why it's hard, you yeah. know, but uh, some people talk. Some people in the very rare occasion, they talk, but usually no. Mm -hmm. No. They have a very in big influence on the entertainment, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could, it, you, you, you can imagine why, right? Because yeah. so that guy is very strong in politics, and then also a lot of members, right? Yes. It's a huge power, you know? Yes. So Kukakai was founded in 1930 by its first president, Tsuna Saburo Makiguchi, who was an educator and Nichiren Buddhist scholar. He first founded the organization as Soka Kyoiku Gakai, which means Value Creating Educational Society. He had converted to Nichiren Buddhism, uh, which yes. is a form of Buddhism developed in the 13th century by the Japanese Buddhist scholar Nichiren. Yes, Nichiren, yes. Yeah, so basically, in order to understand just the basics of it without getting too much into Buddhist scholarship, is that he believed that everyone had the ability to activate their Buddhahood within and reach enlightenment by following a certain path. This actually That's sounds right. really like Taoism. But anyway, so if you follow a certain path, then you can reach enlightenment. That's right. Basically, following a path meaning following what he said, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, well, well, what they say, you know. What Nichi, Nichi Iren, so Makiguchi was by all was by all records a Buddhist scholar really focused on this idea of the relationship between life and education and how mm. to create value in uh, the happiness of the individual and the prosperity of the society at large. So he mm. was really interested in this very practical aspect of Buddhism. Mm. So if we yes. go back to something we had talked about previously, the peace preservation laws, Makiguchi was one of the people who were arrested under that law. So as we said before, during the war, the government ordered that every altar, Shinto or Buddhist, public or at home, should hang up a talisman. Makiguchi refused and was put in prison where he died. After the war, Jose Toda became the leader of the Soka Gakkai and he dropped the 
he dropped the education part of it, and it became a more general organization about reaching Buddhahood. Daisaku Ikeda became the president in 1960, and the organization began to grow exponentially. Currently, they claim they have 20 million members in 192 countries around the world. They've become incredibly involved in politics, and they've actually been supporting political candidates from day one, basically, since the 1950s. But uh, they became politically, they became closely aligned with Komeito. Yeah, but the, the, you, you, you explained it in a nice way. Uh, closely aligned with, right? Basically, you know, uh, they created it. I mean, it makes sense, right? Yeah. M- I mean, the, whether the, or the not they created it or they found a party that was really amendable to their desires. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, basically, Komeito equals... The so, Kukukai. Yeah. Hmm. so we're going to jump back to a colorful character in our story, Shinzo Abe, the current prime minister of Japan. In, nine, in 2016, he won the majority of the Japanese parliament and there was a chance that Abe could try and overturn Article 9 of the Constitution. So Article 9, Atsushi. Article 9? Yeah. Aspiring, sincerely, to an international peace based on justice and order. The Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes. Uh, in order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The light of a belligerency of the state will not be recognized. That's a very, very uh, honorable article. You know, someone should give us Nobel Prize for this. Some, yeah, really, some, some liberal party are saying that, you know, if Nobel Prize were given to this article, right? It's hard for Shinzo Abe to get lit up. So I just wanted to read you an article from the Financial Times that kind of talks about how Abe's um, talks about how Abe's position is supported by the Komeito. But what he can actually do depends on Komeito which draws almost all of its support from the Soka Gakkai religious movement and on the regional Osaka Inshin party, which is also needed for the supermajority. Soka Gakkai members like their current constitution, says one senior official in the movement. I think there is no need to touch Article 9. As Buddhists, members of Soka Gakkai were persecuted by Japan's militarist government in the 1930s and that history is one reason the religion became involved in politics um anyways it's that's what's really interesting right is that now sokogakai um is part of what is propping up shinzo abe but it means that they also have a say in things like this because it's not in their best interest to give abe more power uh, over religion and over uh military i'm in and so you understand why sokokakai would be trying to maintain this peace um and also it's it's really interesting because because how sokokakai is actually a really important force in abe's power and so in japan it's illegal to go door to door campaigning for a candidate but Religious groups like Soka Gakkai can circumvent that because they do something called friend-getting, which means that they call everyone they know. Like, uh, you know, on the, on the day of the voting for, uh, you know, uh, one of uh, uh, classmates at high school, female classmate came, you know, and then they ring the bell and how are you? And uh, what do you do? Did you vote today? Yeah, I, I didn't. <laughs> and, uh, let's go, and I can drive, you know. And then she she drove to the the school where the where I can vote, and uh, she put me back home, you know. 
<laughs> it's nice that she drove you back home at least. That's right. <laughs> that happens, you know. Yeah. And then also, similar thing happens too, you know, in Tokyo. I was living in the neighborhood of the uh, Soka Gakkai's uh, uh, headquarters. And in the same apartment, you know, uh, complex, right? Mm -hmm. Or the building. You know, very devout Komento member or Sokagakai member or sisters were living and they show up at the door, right? They make sure I go to vote, right? They don't ask me whom I vote, so of course they cannot, but they, they cannot and they shouldn't. But they, you know, make sure I go to vote. You know, I think many of the people who are suggested to go to vote by them would vote to them, right? Correct? You know. Oh, what do you mean? Oh, like, would vote according to who yeah. they want yeah. to Yeah, I want to, I want, yeah, if I was, uh, uh, you know, go to, I didn't do that too, though, but I didn't. Right, but, because uh, if you're a person who hasn't given it any thought and you don't know what your options are and someone you know goes, hey, have you voted? And you're like, oh, I, I haven't, I guess I should go. And they're like, oh, who are you going to vote for? And you're like, well, I don't really know who are you going to vote for. And they're like, That's right. oh, I mean, it doesn't really matter, but I think I'm going to vote for the LDP. Oh, really? Mm. What's so good about them? And you're like, oh, well, they're, they're blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh, okay, well, then that sounds great. I'll vote for them too. And then you're That's a right. sucker. That's right. The last reason why we wanted to talk about Soka Gakkai is that, uh, is that Asahara thought that they were his direct enemy because they were growing so fast and he was not growing as fast as them. And so in 1993, Asahara sent people to attack the leader Ikeda with VX gas. Mm. But they failed it though. So they we're failed gonna come it. back to right. this in a later episode. Pardon? Yes. They failed it, right? I mean, Ikeda's still alive, so well, they didn't so, do very yeah. well. Right. Because, uh, you know, uh, you know. Ikeda's yeah, we 90. talk about home later, yeah. Omu, he was uh, like a uh, very, sh you know, a schmuck, you know, <laughs> they, <are both. laughs> they attempted the so absurd things and it never works, but I some mean, worked. it didn't never work. I mean, if it never worked, then we wouldn't be talking. But, but, but some worked, but right? that's the, I mean, that's the big... Even the sarin gas attack in 1995 didn't work very well. I mean, we can talk more about their plans at a later date, which are absolutely sure. crazy. Just yes, to give you a hint, crazy. it involves a helicopter. Their That's original right. sarin gas plan. So we can touch upon that at a later date. But right. I want to move on to Agon Shu, which is the cult that Asahara uh, belonged to for three years. And that's also where he gained his first follower and right-hand woman, who later became the minister of finance within the cult, Hisako Ishii. So Agon... Agon Shu was founded in 1978 by the highly charismatic Kiriyama Seiyu. So as we mentioned, one of the characteristics of a cult is having a highly charismatic leader. And so Kiriyama Seiyu was that for Agon Shu, and in many ways Ikeda was that for Soka Gakkai. And Kiriyama Seiyu was a man who claimed that he had been personally rescued by the Bodhivista canon. And he focused on studying really early Buddhist texts and wore authenticity as a badge. He really celebrated this idea that he had the original Buddhism. And he saw a lot of flaws in the more recent and known strains of Buddhism, including stuff that like Soka Kai was practicing, and they really treated what they had as the original and pure Buddhism. And so one thing I found really interesting about them is that they also talk about this idea of liberating one's ancestors. Who does mm. that remind you of? Liberating the ancestors? Yeah. Liberating... Ah! Our Hiroshi Alaki. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He talks about it in the film. He talks about this idea that like everything he's doing and if he reaches enlightenment his ancestors' spirits will also be free from the karmic wheel. And, yeah. and it's really interesting because it comes from Agonshu. I mean, it might not come only from Agonshu, but yeah, it's something they some, really some similarity. on, and I don't think it's a coincidence that Asahara took that with him. I see. 
I mean, I also thought it was really interesting because uh, Araki had... So Araki is the cult executive with whom you traveled back to your shared hometowns and had a had a conversation which is the basis of the documentary we're working on cult leader and me so araki talks about renunciating his family and how difficult that is for him and i just never right. understood why it would matter that you're liberating your ancestors if you don't even talk to the ones that aren't even dead yet mm. like it, it's like such a weird logic mm. um, yeah most of the case, those cult has the problem when, okay? They can talk about the reincarnation, okay? But do not have the information of this life. You cannot bring it to the another life. If you do that, surely that will lead you to something wrong. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Another thing I found really interesting about Agon Shu is that uh, Seiyu mirrors his old school thought, this idea of original Buddhism, with state-of-the-art technology for aggressive recruiting. In 1987, the Manichi Daily News wrote in an article entitled Agon Shu, the original Buddhism for a modern world, quote, it attracts young people. Kiriyama Seiyu cons- consciously interprets Buddhism into a language that young people can relate to. Thus, the satellite broadcasts, the modern temple building, his friendly sermon, and his approachable manner. All this adds up to a user-friendly religion appropriate to the needs of the modern Japan. This actually reminds me of yoga, because so many yoga studios are talking about how their style is authentic or, or original... Or, or, or something, right? They, they attribute it to a sort of spiritual path, but then they also are using all the latest technology in order to recruit people. So it's, it's, it's very understandable, and, and it's actually something that Om brings with them when, that Asahara brings with him when he sets up Om. Right, he used the yoga. Yoga and also this idea of reaching out to the youth. Yes. Because he did a lot of campaigning on on college campuses. He did a lot of recruiting on college campuses and spoke at That's a right. lot of college campuses. But he's not the only one, though. He's not no, the only one. No, of course one. not. A lot of people did. And actually, it's it's where you met him for the first time, right? Did you actually hear him talk ever? Did, again? did you ever hear Asahara talk? Yeah, uh... No, I saw that he was in the limo and coming down. You just yelled at him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fry, you know, show me a levitation. He never <laughs> did. <laughs> so that's why I thought that he's a fake, you know. <laughs> I was reading a horrible joke on the internet today where they were talking about his execution because in Japan, they execute mm. people by hanging. Mm. And they were saying how it's impossible to execute him because he was levitating. <laughs> But he cannot, right? Truth is. I mean, he's executed, <laughs> so I guess it didn't work. His it didn't work, you know, it didn't work. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. So it's impossible for him to do that. But, you know, but some, one of the very well known attorney, anti Omu attorney, mm-hmm. showed the trick uh, of the levitation. I mean, he's just oh, jumping this... on a trampoline, no? Yeah, no, yeah, no, not trampoline, but uh, just the angle of the camera where the, you set the camera. Yeah. And uh, he sh- jumped like a 10 centimeters, <laughs> and then he flies in the sky like, you know. Yeah. That was, yeah. Yeah, he didn't have funny. access to all the mm. CGI of today. Yeah, and it was very interesting to see how the lucky react if I requ- when I requested him if he can show me a levitation. Can right? he levitate? <laughs> No, I don't know. You watch. What your, did he say? You know, huh? Ah, uh, depends, he right? He's a depends. <laughs> what a loser, depends right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, depends. He says depends. You know, that's what a loser. You know, <laughs> that was his best shot, right? To mm. me. And so, yeah, even though sh- Asahara would claim that his years at Agonshu were detrimental to his training, it's really obviously it's really obvious that he took a lot of it with him when he left including his first follower, Hisako Ishii. Mm. 
From what we know, both groups influenced Om, and we can see that the role of charismatic leader with an ambitious expansion plan who hold mm. the true answer to what they practice. Mm. Um, but I think, I think that, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I prefer not to mention, mm -hmm. but I've heard that uh, uh, Asahara hired the detective research on some new religion. So, Ooh. so... I think that uh, uh, Omu came naturally. I think he sort of uh, intentionally built them up, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so synthesizing he, he ideas, built learning. It like a startup. Yeah. He saw what worked here. He saw what didn't work there, and he tried to build something up. And uh, and many of these cults use this rhetoric of self betterment and achieving enlightenment, which is only possible if you follow their path. Because you know the Japanese education is was is always test, right? And then we, they te they you know maybe American education is very different. Now you can so I went to MBA, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you have no clue, you write something, they give you some point, right? Mm -hmm. In Japan, never happens. You need to have the right answer. That's how we are trained, right? Always we expected to find the right answer, right answer. So I think, if, I think as far as I've seen, the Omu, those people, or people in Japan in general, tend to find the best answer or the answer. That's why we have said that the Japanese is a, a business slow to take actions, right? Because they're trying Before to find jump. the answer first. Right. Same thing for the coronavirus, you know? You know, coronavirus, right? So, so for the other countries, right, they quickly do whatever it is, right? They try anything. Yeah, and then see how it works, right? Japan needs people tend to stand still, think, what is the best, right? And then, go on, you know? <laughs> That's a Japanese... Uh... And a lot of these new religions are offering this answer. That's correct. Very correct. So, right. So, and the, another very interesting thing is, okay, uh, those religions have a system to step up. You can step up because there are answers, right? Yeah. Level of the learning. You can go step up. Keep promoting, which is exactly what you do in school, right? You go up levels and, and also the corporate ladder. So... In a way, it's a very comfortable and familiar system of gaining answers, answering correctly, and then becoming more powerful or, or, or becoming higher in the hierarchy. That's right. And then also, you if you pay more, you get the right, better answer in the higher level, right? Yeah, it's very addictive. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's the it's way. like a mobile that's video a game. That's, that's exactly right. And we can also see that from Soko Gakkai, he took his interest in politics because in the 90s, of course, Ohm runs for elections, which we will also cover. And from Agon Shu, he takes this idea of the importance of media appealing to youth and technology. And so when Ohm was formed in 1984, Japan was already no stranger to new religious groups popping up and recruiting. These new religions were useful in filling the void left by the eerily not godlike emperor forming part of the post-war identity. So at the same time, Japan's economy was doing really, really well, and people were starting to see that money is not everything, and students, especially in colleges, were looking at their futures at this rat race corporate ladder and and really feeling at odds with it and, and looking for answers in these groups during their delicate college years. And it is at these people that Ohm targeted. And it's actually exactly where Araki found mm. Ohm. And then also, uh, you know, until the 80s, Japan uh, experienced uh, uh, so much economic growth as you exper explain, right? Mm -hmm. So during the period, people moved from the rural area to the cities. They joined the uh, Soka Gakkai and the other uh, new religions, okay? Also for Which, the sense of community. That's right. So they didn't, yeah, so in, in, in the big How city, they don't have... get you. Right. 
those people get you, right? Yeah, because you have no friends, and then church is like an immediate set of friends. Yes. It's interesting because my family, okay, mm -hmm. moved from the rural area to near the city. Mm -hmm. And then Araki's family, too. But, you know, and both of them probably have a, a father who are the eldest son in the family, okay? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I thought maybe that's related to him. Maybe not. But you know what? The biggest uh, difference between me and Araki, you know what is the biggest difference? What? He is the probably second eldest son. I am the eldest son. What does that mean? Meaning, I have a... Uh, uh, You're also the only son. That's very true. Araki has that's, two that's, brothers. That's very true, too. So I I had that sort of the uh, pressure that uh, I would inherit the family. I have to be responsible for the family. Whatever. But uh, Araki doesn't. You know That's very different. Yeah, those people would join the new religions easily. Easy, more easily, right? Because they yeah. don't have this understanding that they don't have the responsibility. And then also they don't have, uh, they can, they're allowed in many, more chance to be allowed to believe in something different from the, his father and mother believe in or belong to. Oh, I see what you're saying. Because yeah, they tempo. are not expected to take over the right. head of the family, they have more freedom. And so parents might not be too concerned for a while. Actually, we can come back to this later because there's a lot of stories sure. about families kidnapping and forcing family members to recount. Um, sure. To basically, to basically leave new religions. Um, and these are cases of abuse that the, the police are very weary of processing. So we can come back to this sort of talk about the role of families in young people joining cults at a later date. Right. And we're going to continue to see these themes of recruitment, infatuation with technology and politics cult personalities and the idea of drawing influences from different religions across the board in order to to sell this idea of of an answer um the next in the next episode we're going to delve deeper into the background of the cult and shoko asahara okay atsushi will you say the last bit yeah Please listen and subscribe wherever you listen. Review and rating helps other people find us. Thank you for listening and reach out to us on Twitter at Cult Leader and me. Thank you. This episode was written and produced by me, Pearl Chan, and Atsushi Sakahara.